Welcome, friends and family of Traveling Stories. We're excited for you to join us today, and today we have a special guest. He is um, uh, part of the Church of God of Prophecy. He's over our youth ministries for the General Headquarters, International Youth Director, Kirk Risen. He's also from around this area, too, um, from the South Carolina area, too. So um, it's great to have you on, uh, Brother Kirk. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's my great pleasure to be with you, man. Definitely. And uh, we're uh, super excited uh, to talk to you today. And the first question we always ask our guests, and again, I say this every week because we say it's an easy question until we start to answer it. Um, and that is, do you remember your life um, before you encountered Jesus? Well, I guess, I guess I feel like I was a Christian out of the womb. <laughs> you know, my, my, my father uh, was always in ministry um, that I remember. Um, but he didn't start pastoring until I think I was about, uh, I don't know, five years old. But he planted two churches in uh, North Carolina, and uh, we were living in Wilmington. I was born in Charleston at the uh, Naval Hospital. But uh, when I was nine months old, uh, his hometown is Wilmington up the coast. So, um, you know, I only remember ministry. And so as far as being uh, saved or a bad kid, I don't remember much of it, man. I, I know I did my dirt. I know I had some <laughs> stuff going on, you know, but yeah, but, uh, but uh, always uh, always had a sense of God and always felt like that, uh, of course, we knew know when we we're doing wrong, but, you know, I, I, I feel like I've always been a Christian. Now, as being a, uh, a pastor's kid, um, I, I know that's a, that's a different lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, um, my mother was actually a pastor's kid, and... Um, and, you know, she would tell me stories about how it felt like that was second home. Sometimes it felt like first home. It didn't even feel like the second home. Mm -hmm. um, but with your dad, like, planting, planting churches and, and different things, can you remember life as kind of like a pastor kid and, and how, how that went for you? Well, uh, if he was knocking on doors, I was knocking on doors. <laughs> so I'm, I'm uh, six, seven, eight years old mm -hmm. and uh, going with him everywhere he goes, man. What we would do is uh, we would do it one or two ways. It was back in the day when people knocked on doors, okay? Yeah. Not so safe today, but as Jehovah's Witness and Mormons still do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. We would do it with, uh, we would sell donuts. Still doing that today. Yes. Uh, but we would use it as an opportunity to get the door open because everybody loves Krispy Kreme, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. It was Krispy Kreme first, then Jesus was second. That's right. And then uh, Church Guard of Prophecy was third. <laughs> Okay, so, so how it rolled was you sell donuts if they bought or didn't buy. Uh, are you a Christian? Introduce Jesus. If right. they were a Christian, hey, we're part of the Church of God of Prophecy. <laughs> you know? And so I remember that as a kid. I remember one night we went to a place and, you know, of course, I'm uh, seven, eight years old. So I'm getting tired. Uh, I'm falling asleep. The, the two people in the house the woman would listen to my father and the husband would go upstairs and take a nap. And then he would come back down and she would go up and take a nap. Well, my dad was excited about Jesus, man. You know, <laughs> He wasn't going to leave that house until something happened. That's right. And so, uh, yeah, everything he did, everything he did in ministry, Kirk was doing it in ministry, even though maybe not understanding everything, but, uh, certainly it, uh, it made a mark on my life and, uh, made a mark on what I did in ministry later. Yeah, and that's what I was going to ask too, because um, seeing that example, um, I think that's a big thing, especially nowadays. Um, with the generation that we're living in now, there's uh, a lot of people um, with the busy lifestyles that we have, with parents working and things like that. We don't see those, following those examples anymore. Um, I know in my life, I've had some mentors in my life, and I followed their example and followed them. Um, and I know you'd probably agree Finding those mentors are the best way. I know we believe in the Holy Spirit teaching us and guiding us, but it's also good to have somebody to follow behind to, uh, you know, Timothy had a fall. You know, we go down the list. What would you say about that? Well, I, you know, I am um, think my viewpoint on mentoring is, is a little different. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly don't go out and look for people to, or look for young people that I want to make them like me. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't mind living a life in front of them that when sure. they see something in me, yeah. they say, hey, you know, I would want that. Or uh, I had one young man tell me one time, he, uh, we were in the altar and he said, listen, I want to thank you for everything you said in the pulpit. He said, I can remember things that you said. He quoted things back to me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow. You know, and so, but he said, the way you love your family. Yeah. The way you love your wife. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. So me not knowing that I'm loving uh, to the point of people seeing it, sure. you know, he saw that thing and that's the, that's the thing he wanted to attach to. So I'm never one that says, you know, you know, don't, don't attach yourself to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I let people know that, Hey, I'm, I'm flawed. That's right. You know, I've got problems, For sure. but by the grace of God, I try to every day live a life that is pleasing to him. But certainly, certainly we all fail. That's right. Now I know with you saying you were serving with your dad as soon, you know, eight years old, going to houses, knocking on doors. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first time that you actually, you know, felt a calling into the ministry, uh, and, and you know, even into a local church and, um, and not just serving on your own, but you felt that calling to teach or preach or, 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 uh, you know, worship anyway. Um, do you remember that calling? Well, you know, I remember, man, you know, I, of course I come up with all these dudes that you live around, you know, Johnny Beecham, uh, Gene, um, uh, Jimmy Butts. Yes, yes. There's a name in infamy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Chucky, all those guys. Um, and of course, as you come up and, and one guy's getting into ministry, you feel like, you know, maybe you want to do that same thing. It was later in life that I learned that we're all called. That's right. And so my, uh, of course, not everybody's called to a pulpit. Right. And maybe even with me, uh, my ministry started with uh, several different ways. It started in ministry. It also started in graphics. Yeah. Okay. So I was doing graphics and, and video. And so I put the two together. Um, you know, I feel like for me that my purpose for living is to be in a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. God's will for my life is that I bring others into a relationship with God. So whoever Kirk is, whatever Kirk possesses, whatever Kirk does, it needs to bring others into a relationship with God. Uh, I didn't learn that till later in life, uh, later in my ministry. Uh, you know, I can remember my first sermon, a guy that used to be in South Carolina, used to be the state youth director in South Carolina. His name is Larry Turner. Okay. Okay. Now Larry's from Virginia, but he was in South Carolina when brother, I think it was brother Curry was overseer of South Carolina. Anyway, you know, Larry thought he was my, uh, he thought he was my mentor. <laughs> he thought he was my guru. Right. And yeah. so of course, you know, we all doing our first sermon and we're either, either two minutes or we're an hour. That's you right. That's and so right. I fell, I fell on the hour side. Right. And so I, I'm speaking and I'm, I think I got up to like 40 minutes or something. And he's standing in the back of the church doing this, <laughs> you know, trying to, you know, in his own way, yeah, uh, trying to teach me. Um, but, you know, I find that sometimes the messages that I preach are so many times outside the pulpit than inside yeah. the pulpit. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, and, and again, it's just being that example, even though we're not trying to be the example, just living life how we're supposed to live life. Um, I, I know you also um, before uh, you was talking about doing graphics and things, and that's really before today's we're we're leading on graphics and different things, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, how you know, especially in the church, uh, you know, it was more outside, you know, advertising and things like that. And then we slowly started bringing those into the church. Um, technology in the church is something that um, I believe in and I have a passion for. I believe that can help the atmosphere um, and, and help us get to a point, um, distract, take some of the distractions out or help us reach others or help us, you know, different things like that. Uh, what's, your, what's your thoughts on the technology being used in church? Uh, you know, for me, I, I, uh, it's where I started. So you're talking about, you're talking about in the 80s. Yeah. You know, late '80s that I'm I'm starting to em employ technology into my uh, ministry, into my speaking, into my teaching, uh, video, uh, graphics, projection, all that stuff. Really, when it was in its infancy, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, as the generations have changed, used to be, you know, that generation could sit for an hour, sit for an hour and a half, sit for two hours, you know, 
some of those blues would go two and a half hours, you know, and still yeah. start blowing. And, um, but I had to, um, of course, as the generations have gone forward and because of technology, because of social media, attention spans have become, you know, shorter. Right. So they say this generation, uh, generation Z and generation alpha coming up, their attention spans are eight seconds. So you've got, you know, Snapchat, um, Instagram, and now TikTok, you know, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, uh, used to be six seconds with uh, Vine, right? I think so. Six yeah, six, like, yeah, six seconds, yeah. Six or 10 seconds, I, don't, I forget what it was. But man, people were crazy over it. And so it's those kinds of things that has uh, tailored our kids. Of course, you know, they're multi-screen, yeah, sure. multi-engaged. Now, like right now, I've got uh, a phone, an external monitor. I've got me and you sitting here. And I got a TV behind me. It's not on, but you know, I you know, four screens going on at the same time, and I'm you know, I'm 55, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, but that's only because I, I deal in youth, and and I try not that I try to make this happen because of who I am and what I do. It makes it happen. Okay. Uh, even social media in church, you know, I think it's it, if you don't use it, uh, you're not going to touch this generation. That's right. You know, so if you if you don't use it. Uh, effectively and to the glory of God, that's a problem. That's right. You know, because I, I, man, I look at so many dudes today, and we've heard of so many young guys failing that are on, on uh, what we consider to be the the top levels. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the guy from um, uh, what's the, what's the church? Hillsong, Hillsong, New York. Yeah, he just yeah just got let go. Yeah, right. J Justin Bieber's pastor. That's okay? right. So here's a dude who who was into his self self projection. Mm -hmm. Okay, he he clung to the the uh, to the famous. Uh, but here's a guy who stood in the pulpit every Sunday. Social media guy, right? But he was also being unfaithful to his wife the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I've and I've had some other guys, other friends of mine that have been in ministry that because of the effects of technology and media, uh, they failed. And they stand in the pulpit every Sunday, still preaching and teaching. And uh, it, 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 it's a tough road. But, uh, yeah, I think technology and social media used the right way is, is certainly a tool we have to have in the church. Yeah, especially at the time that we're recording this because of with, uh, you know, COVID going on and different things. I, I believe there's a lot of pastors, a lot of churches that have been left behind um, because they or not. I won't say left behind, but are trying to catch up because mm -hmm. of um, not being prepared. Um, you know, I, I think in what March, most churches that we know of had to go virtual or, or they just didn't have service at all. Um, and, and, you know, to get the word out, to not just get the word out, uh, uh, to make sure people are safe, to make sure people, you know, visiting people in small groups and different things. Yeah. Um, and and, and I, I totally agree with you. It has to be used right, as you said, because we can fall into so many traps when it comes into technology. And um, too, I think that, you know. Uh, you as a pastor and many older pastors, um, they're afraid of what's going to happen once COVID's over. That's right. Who's going to come back? Yeah. Will Will people re-engage physically? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Even yeah. uh, I have a friend that works for a mega church uh, that helps me develop some for youth ministry. He's at uh, Free Chapel. Yeah. Okay. So they got 25,000 members. Yeah. Uh, he's got uh, two services of maybe... Uh, I don't know, seven, 8,000. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're afraid because those churches become, they're, they're marketing machines. That's right. If they're not continuously marketing, they're not drawing people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because there's not a real witness where they're going out and, and people are being saved. You know, people want to come and experience uh, the atmosphere. That's right. And so if uh, they're afraid that when they come back, Boy, you know, what is that going to look like? That's right. And of course, the dollars, that's always an effect in church. Definitely. definitely. I know um, I have some friends that go to New Springs, which, is, you know, is the, uh, you know, right up the road from us here in Williamston. And, and they're going through the same, you know, the same thought pattern as are people just going to get comfortable and say, OK, I can watch this online and sit here and watch that. And what is it going to look like when we come back? That's the reason why we've got to be prepared both ways, be ready to go uh, on that, you know, on that stand. Um, mm -hmm. But that being said, I know uh, you did uh, some youth ministry uh, before uh, you got into this, if I'm not correct, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. um, and 
in those times of youth ministry, in those beginnings, uh, you know, that sometimes, and I was a youth pastor too for uh, eight years, and I know youth ministry can be a uh, a roller coaster of a ride sometimes. <laughs> um, some days you're like, man, we're awesome, we're doing great, and then next yeah. week you have just a few people there. Um, so when you were a youth minister, um, what kind of advice was given to you to help you through those struggling times and through those hard times? Uh, none. <laughs> 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 you know, it's one of those where, you know, here, you know what I'm saying? Here. That's right. And, and uh, you know what's funny right now? Johnny Beecham's calling me on another line. <laughs> you know um, no, it's, it's, um, this is my, it'll be my 35th year in ministry. All of them has been in youth ministry. Yes. Okay. My 20, I think it's my 26th year full-time youth ministry. Okay. Are doing something in ministry full time, um, so it's a um, boy. Sometimes the communication between a pastor and those he appoints, uh, he's just glad to have somebody out there. Yes, ministering to women, ministering to men, ministering to youth, and so really the communication is uh, really they maybe probably don't know how to communicate to a youth pastor. You know what are they going to tell them? How to, how to touch young people. They're not young, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, you're young. So, Hey, you know, you, you got an advantage. Mm -hmm. You can still get out there and kick it with them. Mm -hmm. They, their kick left long ago. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it, it's, um, it, it's a shame, but I think the breakdown for us, especially in the church of prophecy probably has always been, um, leader to appointed or leader to the volunteer. Mm -hmm. Uh, keeping communications, knowing how to communicate, um, finding some way to um, build each other up, yes. resource each other. Uh, man, there's just so many things that, you know, we haven't done a good job in. And, and that's not just us. It's, it's across, you know, across the kingdom, across denominations. Um, we've let generations, you know, separate and divide. And uh, in the in the uh, training that we have now in youth ministry, uh, two or three of the sections are uh, it's just all about working together with pastor and leader. That's right. And I um, and I'll say and we just uh, my youth uh, pastor at Restoration Chapel, Courtney James, we just went through some of that training ourselves. And uh, mm -hmm. and I, I will admit it was great to hear her thoughts on ministry and my thoughts on ministry and coming together and bringing those together. It was really great. Sometimes you want to cry. Sometimes you want to get mad. Sometimes you want to be like, man, we're doing it totally wrong, but it was good to have those communications and those things. Yeah. And, and um, I will say, and I, and I thank God for what we're doing in, in the organization now and pushing those out, those type of things out um, to help um, not just throw youth ministers or even pastors out just to say, Hey, now go preach. Or, or go teach or, or, you know, things like that. Um, because we're, we're now getting to the point where we're saying, you know, if everything else uh, deserves further education, then why don't pastoring or youth pastoring or Sunday school teaching, you know, go to further, you know. And so um, I will say I, I thank God for those, those things coming out. But that being mm -hmm. said, the importance of that education, and we just talked about it just a little bit, the importance mm -hmm. of that education. What would you tell young men and young women that feel a calling into the ministry that say, oh, I got it. I'm good. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we have a lot of them that say, oh, I'm called by God. And that's true. You are mm -hmm. called by God. Mm -hmm. But it's always good to uh, keep learning, keep growing. What would you say to those that, that are going through that right now? I think, first of all, I think, you know, if uh, you, probably my next step uh, would be pastoring. Okay. Now, uh, I always kid around and say, well, you know, I don't want to pastor because I hate people. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You know, of course, I'm saying, really, I'm saying I love people, yeah. but people have problems. That's right. You know, and, and to be a pastor, man, it goes beyond their spirituality, man. It goes to their families. It goes to, you know, when something goes wrong with the family, if they're saved or not saved, they're calling you. Right. You know, it, it's a big job. And so, you know, for most young people, they see the pulpit. And so my encouragement would be, um, you know, hey, uh, let's see who you are. Right. Let's evaluate what you do. Let's look at your strengths. And now let's fit ministry to that versus I'm going to point you to be a youth leader. That's right. 
uh, even in education, you know, there's not too many uh, seminaries, there's not too many um, colleges, universities that offer youth ministries degrees. Yeah. Now they have churches that they have uh, seminaries that offer courses that, yeah. that sporadically help in in ministry. Um, you know, but I don't think education is the um, is the key. It can help certainly. Yeah. It can help you form sermons. It can help you study. It can help you systematically work through things. It can help you in leadership. All those kinds of things, but you are either affected with people or you're not. That's right. You know what I'm saying? And right. just because you stand in a pulpit doesn't mean that people give you their loyalty or their allegiance. Yeah. And so, you know, it's up to me. Okay. It's up to me as a leader and you as a pastor, right. man, you try to look at people and recognize what they're, what they're, we call them gifts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, who they are. you got to recognize who that is. And then some, I remember uh, in Greensboro when I was youth pastor, I would do Bible study. Every kid in there was, you know, riding, riding the fence, mm -hmm. sin and, and, and righteous, you know, sin and righteous like we do. Yes. Uh, but the one they wanted to hear from was the sinner. They wanted to hear what he had to say because he was funny. Yeah. He affected people and they wanted to know how he felt about something. He, but the you know, thing was, is that he knew the Bible. Right. He'd grown up a Christian. And they wanted to hear from him. Well, Kirk would be one that would say, hey, I know you're not saved, but you're going to get saved. Or I'll beat it into you, one of the two. And then, and then once, once you get to that place, hey, I want you to consider, you know, uh, affecting young people or being a part of ministry. And, and let that, you know, just let it rest where it is. Um, and it's so tough to see guys that think the pulpit is their thing and they do it and fail. That's right. You know, so uh, my encouragement would be certainly study, certainly find education that would help you deal with the generation, help you deal with young people. But man, you've got to learn how to uh, effectively work with people. And the biggest thing that is love. That's right. That's right. Um, with that being said, I know you um, now have been the youth uh, general headquarters, our general headquarters youth uh, leader for how long now, if I'm not mistaken? This is my sixth year. Six year, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, in that six years, you've been able to travel and go all over the world. Um, what is youth ministry like? Um, I know because a lot of times as Americans, we have that small inner, hey, this is what it's like here. What's youth ministry like around the world? And let me say sorry for the sound. I, I think my wife's diving off the uh, stair, stair, stair banister or something. Uh, it's okay. uh, no but, uh, uh, well, you know, it's, uh, I think it's pretty much everywhere you go. I know that things move in waves. Yes. Uh, just as in Europe, um, time of the awakening, uh, as it moves from Europe and they move into a atheistic, agnostic, way of life uh, it comes into the Americas. Well, as it has come into the Americas, now the same thing is happening to America. Agnostic, atheistic, unchurched, unchristian generation that we live in today. And now that wave has moved into Central and South America. And so what we used to do here in North America, where we started events and conferences and all those kinds of things, boy, as it moves into Central and South America, it is like fire. Yeah. Yeah, you know they're growing. Uh, they're being effective in their in their countries, in their communities. Um, and then as you move into Asia, it's uh, it's sporadic. And, and I'm talking about the Church Code of Prophecy, definitely. Uh, but uh, it's more. Sometimes it can get performance based. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's in a drama. Everybody's in a dance troupe. Everybody's in a something to keep them in church. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it seems like revival is coming back around to Europe. Gotcha. At least for us, it is. Yes. Okay. And so um, within us, there's a move for education. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you find a lot of our young guys who are getting into ministry. They're they're uh, looking into seminaries, those kinds of things. And so, um, but at the end of the day. Young people just want to be loved. Definitely. They want to be cared for. They want to be a part. 
They want to find somewhere to plug in. Uh, they want to serve. Okay. They want to serve by nature, but maybe they go to a church that service is not a part of what they do, mm -hmm. but their very nature says do something to help humanity. You know what I'm saying? Yes, so, so the greater world we live in is all about helping humanity. And so because that's in them, we've got to find ways of helping them serve their church, their home and their community. That's right. Um, so now over the 30, you said 35 years, if I'm not mistaken, of being a part of youth ministry in some way, would you say it's different from 35 years ago? Would you say, um, or, or, or basically we're going through the same things that we've always gone through. It's just, uh, just, just a different season of it. How, what would you say about that? I would think so in many ways. I, I, um, you know, of course, back when the church was, of course, I don't, I don't, are you, are you church guy prophecy all your life? Yes, all my life. Yes. Okay. So, so your mom, yeah. you're what, second or third generation? Yes. Third generation. Um, you know, of course, what they majored on back during those times, mm -hmm. all that's changed. Yes. Definitely. But I was one that out as I was growing up where most kids wouldn't wear shorts or go to, you know, certain places or whatever. You know, I, I wasn't that person. Yeah. You know, I played basketball in high school, so I had to wear shorts, you know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, and then uh, it was only what they call mixed bathing. And I would say, well, it's only mixed bathing if you know them, you know? So <laughs> um, it's, it's, um, but then we can, we too, in this generation of the Church of God of Prophecy, uh, we've lost identity. We're the generation that really grew, okay, which is your mom yeah. and before your mom, mm -hmm. they were focused on something, and that was who, what they were a part of, okay? And so as it moves into Central and South America, boy, they're passionate about the Church of God of Prophecy, yes. but, but, but they're not passionate to the point where they forget Jesus. I got you. And, and that's sometimes what the balance that, that messed us up is we were so church-heavy we didn't give preeminence to Jesus, you know, the, the Christ of the church. Right. And so, uh, in fact, one of the reasons that I did one conference this year was to help form and to shape a genesis of an identity in the young people of the Church of God of Prophecy. Yeah. Because many of them didn't know that all these young people that they saw at one conference were a part of them, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, 80, 80 countries, which were in 135, but 80 participated. Yeah. And so to see Africa, to see Asia, to see, you know, it was like, oh, my goodness. You know, so now who they think the Church of God of Prophecy is, it's changed. That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. And so uh, that's what, uh, you know, that's the, that's the biggest thing I see missing among young people today is just an identity. And so if we can sh uh, reshape the identity of Jesus in this generation, then we become the Church of God of Prophecy followers of Jesus. That's right. And um, so with that being said, I know um, there's been a lot of planning that has been put to the side, but a lot of planning still there because um, of COVID and different things. Sure. Um, uh, what, what do you see like uh, the youth ministries of the Church of God of Prophecy in the next five years? You know, uh, probably this is my, you know, this is my last two um, used to be a big secret, you know what I'm saying? Oh my God, he's going out. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, it used to be wait till the assembly, you know. Yeah. Kind of, <laughs> you know, I just, uh, and I think, and, and let me just put a, a, you know, chase a squirrel. Um, uh, you know, in ministry, it's always good to know when your time's up. Yes. It's always good to know. It's always good for you to say, my time's up versus somebody coming to you saying, hey, your time's up. Yes. Definitely. You know? yeah. um, but, um, I see more depth in education, whether that's good or bad. I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> what, what I don't want to see in us is that we put so much emphasis on education that those same people who are becoming educated and therefore get the opportunity to be in position. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to deal with people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes, they can put a three point sermon together. Yes. They can, uh, you know, they can do good hermeneutics and, you know, all these, which is wonderful. And that's part of it. You know, right. they need that. Um, but to be able to harness all that and to use it, but yet still be effective with people and know how to love people. You know, that's the key. Yes. Uh, 
I know many pastors. In fact, the pastor I just left before I came here, um, he was a graduate of Thomason College, but you would never know. He, you would think he's a graduate of hunting. <laughs> that's what he likes to do. He likes to hunt. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But he was a pastor who loved. And so everywhere he uh, pastored because of his sense of love, his churches grew. Yeah. Because he was in every wedding. He was in every ball game. He was at every, you know, you name it, that pastor was there loving people, taking care of people. And so, you know, many of our, once again, we get focused on the pulpit. We get focused on the notoriety. Social media has hurt, you know, we've got kids that they're doing stuff on social media and nobody's watching. Yeah. But they continue to do it because they perceive that just because I'm on social media, I'm causing an effect. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. And so, um, so my prayer is in the next five years uh, with the Church of God of Prophecy <clears throat> is that they will continue some of the things that uh, we put in as a foundation, mm -hmm. especially the training. Uh, my prayer is that, that will continue and that more will be built on top of that. Even like uh, Global Serve Day, mm -hmm. uh, which we had back in, um, I believe it was April. Yeah, yeah April 30th. Um, you know, we had 400 and... I think about 450 churches around the world participate in Global Serve Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And thousands joined in just individually. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to continue to do that. But service as a as a core value is something new. Yes. Yeah. You know, we, we haven't stated that yet. We were going to state that in this this assembly this, that was canceled. Uh, they were going to talk about service being a core value. But my prayer is that. Uh, it doesn't take it to be a core value. It's just who we are. That's right. You know what I'm saying if they want to make it a core value, that's wonderful. But if they never did, we still have to serve home, church, and community. That's right. That's right. Um, with that being said, towards the end of every podcast, we like to do a little word association. And uh, this is always fun. Um, okay. and, um, and we just ask you what your thoughts are. It don't have to be one word. It can be one word. It can be a thought. It can be a quote. Either way. But uh, we have a good time with this. Um, the first word I want to give you is the church. You messing me up, man. Okay. <laughs> all right. The church. Uh, Jesus. Jesus. All right. Worship. Man. Multifaceted. Um, music in worship. Need more jazz. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't mind lyrics, but some of the songs we sing, man, it's like, you know, I got to bleed for God, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but man, yeah, uh, it, it's, and I think too, worship for young people, sometimes we get into mantras. Yes. Trying to create or to bring on atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so we, we'll take a song that has uh, a verse and a chorus, and it'll take us 30 minutes to sing one song. Yeah. I'm not saying that's so bad. I'm saying you're going to find churches like that, and you're going to find groups like that. But, uh, man, that's why I say, you know, church uh, worship being multifaceted. Yes. You know, that it goes beyond singing, goes beyond just praying. It goes beyond. It's a lifestyle. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, the Word of God. The Bible. Um, prayer. Let me say two things. It's a must, and we can't let it be a crutch. Would you like to expand and, a little bit on that? And, and, and I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, sometimes we say we're a church of prayer. Okay, so that's all we do is pray. Okay, now I'll show you my faith by my works. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yes, I got what you're saying. Yeah. So if my only work is prayer, then I'm not fulfilling the Great Commission. That's right. And so sometimes we even say that, well, our part in the kingdom is prayer. It's everybody's part in the kingdom is to pray. That's right. You know what I'm saying? We have to have a relationship with God. Come on now. Right. But, you know, uh, I cannot pray. God gives me blessings. God gives me provision. God gives me power. And I not go and bring somebody else into that relationship. That's right. If, if I don't, I, I'm not fulfilling the will of God. 
right? I always, so. I always say that prayers work. I mean, you, you got to put in the work afterwards because I think about it, you know, I have, I've was once told, um, I told somebody I was praying for a job. They said, that was great. Did you do a resume? <laughs> I was like, and, and, but yeah. it, was, it was a simple lesson to be like, we can sit and pray all day long, but if we don't yeah. put the work in through the prayer, then as, as you said, we, yeah, it, that's, it, that's like, great. No, it's, it's the truth. You know, we, man, I, I, it's almost, I'm not saying I get frustrated, but I do get frustrated is because I know that sometimes it, it, it does become, and, and prayer is, you know, first of all, uh, we got to know the word of God. Right. Because we have to know what to pray. Right. Okay. Um, God's not going to say anything different than what's in his word. Okay. Because it's what he left us. Right. Okay? It's the only thing he left us. And so to understand the heart of my father, man, I got to be with my father and, and listen to his words. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. So that if I know my father, that, that what he provides for me is a, is a roof over my head and food. And, you know, of course my dad's dead, but, all the things that he provided for me, those are the things that I continuously talk with him about. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I only know, I only understood it through his word. Right. And so, um, so if we know his word, we are in communication with him. We are in love with him and he is commanding us to go. Right. That's right. Um, the next word is uh, the next generation. surprising and i say that into what we will become yes. you know because there's uh i don't know i don't know if people see it but uh in some places because we're afraid of youth we just let them run rampant mm -hmm. in other places where they do understand youth and they've employed them uh, boy church is looking different yeah you know what i'm saying yes yes and so especially among us to see a young youth led church. You know, we have more right now. we have more ministers over the age of 80 yeah. than we do under the age of 40. You know, so does that, you know, that tells you something. Yeah. Okay. But there are pockets where churches are being progressive. Um, but it also has to be a mature church that if they allow young people to be in position or in appointment, they have to be gracious yeah because they're going to make mistakes right you know i'm sure how, how old are you i'm 36 just turned 36. okay so you're 36 so there's probably some you know some older dudes in that church that every time they hear you preach oh yes they're like you'll learn yeah. <laughs> you know i never forget the first time i preached the first message i preach uh my grandfather was there who's a bishop in the church i've uh, been a part of the church for 30 something years brother uh -huh. vickers um uh state overseer uh -huh. He was there, Bishop Vickers, uh, brother Roy Suggs was there, Bishop Roy Suggs. And uh, I get up there to preach and I'm like, hold up, all these. And then afterwards, there was a couple of them that came over and said, listen, you'll learn. <laughs> as you say, right? That's exactly right, man. You know, Roy, Roy, and, Roy and my dad used to, uh, used to play golf together all the time. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, I think about Tim. You yeah. Know, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it's – and the shame is, is that some of those guys will sit there and let you make mistakes and let you be ineffective and never say a word. Yes. Versus, you know, and, and of course this don't help. No. You know, <laughs> that don't help. But um, it's when you fall, when you make mistakes, when you're not being effective, that a guy can come and love on you to the point of, hey, uh, maybe you need to, why don't you look into some uh, seminary uh, courses? Yes. Maybe on how to prepare sermons or, or study up on how to prepare a good three-point sermon. Okay. And why don't you write the sermon and give it to me and let me check it out. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yes, of course, so, you know, probably, probably they didn't do it, but you have the knowledge to, to at least, you know, put those kinds of things into action. So at you at 36, as you're watching a kid at 18, That's right. you know, you need to be looking for, you know, where's he failing? Where's he excelling? Uh, what can I resource him with that would make him a more effective preacher or teacher? You know, those kinds of things. That's right. Um, the next word, Church of God or Prophecy? Boy, it's, you know, it's bad when you say that, is that, you know, I'm at the, 
and and that's not penny roses on me. I'm at, I'm at the highest level of leadership, mm -hmm. and so I see some really great things, yeah. and then I see some scary things. Yeah. And I think that's in every denomination. I think it's in every church. Yeah. Um, so uh, I feel like that given freedom in certain areas, uh, great things, great things. Well, now that we've come to the end, the last question I always ask is if you just preached a sermon, you just talked to somebody, they gave their life to God. Um, and they came up to you and said, uh, Pastor Kurt, what's, what's next? What's my, what's my next step? What would you tell somebody that just given their life to God, what their next step was? I think certainly I would, you know, encourage them to be in God's word. Uh, certainly encourage them to pray. Uh, but I would encourage them to, hey, let's go. Me and you, you know. Listen, I'm flawed. I'm, I got my problems. That's right. You, you can watch, but hey, let's do this thing together. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's right. And, and, and you know, I suspect that, I don't know, Timothy, maybe in his uh, following of Paul, he saw some things in Paul that were like, you know, that he saw when Paul was Saul. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Paul, you know, when Paul says, listen, you know, I was given a, a something that buffeted me. I prayed three times that it would be removed. Mm -hmm. But God said, you know, my grace is sufficient for you and, and, and your weakness. I'm strong. OK. Mm -hmm. And so I suspect that maybe Timothy saw some things. I know ministers that I've followed, not really followed, but maybe I was just around and watched their lives. Even my father. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw flaws. Yeah. And. Um, I think every, I know every father prays that his son would do better than he did. Yes. You know, my, I say that for my son and my daughter. Uh, I look at my father's life and how he ministered and what he did. You know, one, one of the most telling things I've ever seen um, about my dad, which, you know, he, if, if anybody was my mentor, he was him. Mm -hmm. okay, he, he's that guy. Uh, I really didn't follow other men. Um, anyway, at, at his funeral, Every guy that was there was everything from black, white, Puerto Rican, you know, all cultures. Yes. And also from every walk of life. Everything from a doctor all the way down to a service military guy. Mm -hmm. And what they always said is that Doug loved me. Doug always cared for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't about his preaching. Yeah. It wasn't about his teaching. It wasn't about the way he ran a church. It was that Doug was always there. Doug was, you know... Doug cried with me, Doug laughed with me. He was just that dude. And so um, here, I think Kirk will be successful in that when I die, that young people are fighting each other to carry my casket. Yes. I'd rather, instead of having six pallbearers, I'd rather have the whole church lined with young people and you just pass me down to, you know, yeah. you throw, throw me in a ditch somewhere. You know, I would, I would think that would be, uh, that would be success. Definitely. Well, I thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're a very busy man. Um, I will say that, uh, you can follow on any social media, correct? You have, uh, uh I know Instagram, Facebook, um, uh, uh, Snapchat. Uh, I do, but I don't use it. Okay. I got you. I got you. Yeah, so at schedule. I've got a TikTok, but hey, I don't know how to do dances, you know, <laughs> and, and shake it, shake it in the back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> TikTok is wild, man. It is. You know, it I, is I, I might get do that little jumping one. You know, I can do you know one of them. <laughs> but, but yeah, but yeah, but you can follow <laughs> anything about youth ministries on. I know Facebook and Instagram. It's all there. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. And also the website. Uh, the website is yminternational.org and also YM Certification, which is the training side. So ymcertification.org, yminternational.org. Definitely. We'll uh, link all that down below and, and in the uh, podcast information, we'll put that on also. Um, but we want to thank you so much, uh, Pastor Kurt. Um, any final words for our, um, for our listeners? Um, well, the two things I always share with young people is uh, God's purpose for your life is that you be in relationship with him. God's will for your life is that you bring others into a relationship with him. And the third thing is serve humanity. Yeah. 
yes. serve their needs. Uh, so, you know, God bless you. Thank you for uh, the, these moments. I mean, this, for me, it's great because, you know, to talk about my life is, um, it's easy, you yeah. know, but, uh, and I don't mind being transparent, you know, <laughs> as I am probably too transparent, but um, it, it's just an honor for me to be with you. And my prayer for you is that God would, once again, that you'd love him with all your heart and that you bring others into a relationship with God. Definitely. Well, I want to again say thank you so much. And for you that are watching this, if you'd like to see more, we have these on Facebook, on the Restoration Chapel page, Facebook Live. Um, every Wednesday night, we post these at six o'clock. Also, you can follow us on YouTube. They're actually on two different YouTube pages. You can find it on the Restoration Chapel YouTube page, or you can find it on Traveling Stories YouTube page. We have them on both of those. Also, the podcast, you can follow us on the bot anywhere on podcast. We have it on Spotify, on Anchor. We have it on uh, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast. I have people all the time come to me and say, well, Bobby, I found it on this, and I can't post it because I don't have a clue where it was at. So, uh, But if you find it, that's great. Just tap in uh, Traveling Stories. And we thank you so much for listening and watching this. Thank you again, Pastor Kirk. Uh, and I want to just say I always end like this. Now that you've heard our stories, you go make your stories. And then go tell your story so people far from Christ can hear how great our God is. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We love each and every one of you. God bless you. And we will